The Lost Lady by Melville Davison Post. It was a remark of old Major Carrington that incited this adventure. It is some distance through the wood. Is she quite safe? It was a mere reflection as he went out. It was very late. I do not know how the dinner, or rather the after hours of it, had lengthened. It must have been the incomparable charm of the woman. She had come this night luminously, it seemed to us, through the haze that had been on her, the smoke haze of a strange, blighting fortune. The three of us had been carried along in it with no sense of time. My sister, the ancient Major Carrington, and I. He turned back in the road, his decayed voice whipped by the stimulus of her into a higher note. Suppose the village coachman should think her as lovely as we do, what? He laughed and turned heavily up the road a hundred yards or so to his cottage set in the pine wood. I stood in the road watching the wheels of the absurd village vehicle, the yellow cut under, disappear. The old major called back to me. His voice seemed detached, eerie with a thin laugh in it. I thought him a particularly villainous-looking creature. It was an absurd remark. The man was one of the natives of the island, and besides, the innkeeper was a person of sound sense. He would know precisely about his driver. I should not have gone on this adventure, but for a further incident. When I entered the house, my sister was going up the stair. The butler was beyond in the drawing room, and there was no other servant visible. She was on the first step, and the elevation gave precisely the height that my sister ought to have received in the accident of birth. She would have been wonderful with those four inches added. Lacking beauty, she had every other grace. She spoke to me as I approached. Winthrop, she said, what was the package that Madame Barr has carried away with her tonight? The query very greatly surprised me. I thought Madame Barras had carried this package away with her several evenings before when I had put her English banknotes in my box at the local bank. My sister added the explanation, which I should have been embarrassed to seek at the moment. She asked me to put it somewhere on Tuesday evening. It was forgotten, I suppose. I laid it in a drawer of the library table. What did it contain? I managed an evasive reply for the discovery open possibilities that disturbed me. Some certificates, I believe, I said. My sister made a little pretended gesture of dismay. I should have been more careful. Such things are of value. The certificates in Madame Barris's package that had lain about on the library table were gold certificates of the United States Treasury, ninety-odd of them, each of a value of one thousand dollars. My sister went, how oddly life has tossed her about. She must have been a mere infant at Miss Page's. The attachment of incoming tots to the older girls was a custom. I do not recall her. There was always a string of mites with Shiny pigtails and big-eyed, wistful faces. The older girls never thought very much about them. One has a sworn memory, but individuals escape one. The older girl in these schools fancied herself immensely. The little satellite that attached itself for its adoration had no identity. It had a nickname, I think, or a number I've, I've forgotten. We minimize these midges out of everything that could distinguish them. Fancy one of these turning up in Madame Barras and coming to see me on the memory of it. It was extremely lucky for her, I said. Imagine arriving from the interior of Brazil on the invitation of Mrs. Jordan to find that lady dead and buried, with no friend until by chance one happened on your name in the social register and ventured on a school attachment of which there might remain perhaps a memory only of the infant side. My sister went up on the stair. I'm glad we happened to be here, and especially, Winthrop, if you have been able to assist her. She is charming. Charming was the word descriptive of my sister, for it is a thing of manner from a nature elevated and noble. But it was not the word for Madame Barras. The one was allure. I mean the term in its large and Catholic sense. I mean the bait of a great cosmic impulse the most subtle and the most persistent of which one has any sense. 
The cunning intelligences of that impulse had decked her out with every attractiveness as though she had taken thought to confound all masculine resistance, to sweep into her service those refractory units that withheld themselves from the common purpose. She was lovely as the aged Mr. Carrington had uttered it. Great violet eyes and a delicate skin sewn with gold flecks, a skin so delicate that one felt that a kiss would tear it. I do not know from what source I have that expression, but it attaches itself out of my memory of descriptive phrases to Madame Barras, and it extends itself as wholly descriptive of her. You will say that the long and short of this is that I was in love with Madame Barras, but I point you as a witness in Major Carrington. He had the same impressions, and he had but one passion in his life, a distant worship of my sister that burns steadily even here at the end of life. During the few evenings that Madame Barras had been in to dinner with us, he sat in his chair beyond my sister in the drawing-room, perfect in his early Victorian manner, while Madame Barras and I walked on the great terrace, or sat outside. One had a magnificent sweep of the world at night from that terrace. It looked out over the forest of pines to the open sea. Madame Barras confessed to the pull of this vista. She asked me what direction the Atlantic entered, and when she knew, she kept it always in her sight. It had a persisting fascination for her. At all times in nearly any position, she was somehow sensible of this vista. She knew the lights almost immediately, and the common small craft blinking about. Tonight she had sat for a long time in nearly utter silence here. There was a faint light on the open sea as she got up to take her leave of us. What would it be, she wondered. I reply that it was some small craft coming in. A fishing boat? Hardly that, I said, from its lights and position it will be some swifter power boat, and I should say not precisely certain about the channel. I have been drawn here into reminiscence that did not, at the time, detain me in the hall. What my sister had discovered to me, following Major Carrington's remark, left me distinctly uneasy. It was very nearly two miles to the village. The road was wholly forest, and there would be no house on the way. For my father, with an utter disregard for cost, had sought the seclusion of a large acreage when he had built this absurdly elaborate villa on Mount Desert Island. Besides, I was in no mood for sleep and, over all probability, there might be some not entirely imaginary danger to Madame Barras, not precisely the danger presented in Major Carrington's pleasantry, but the always possible danger to one who is carrying a sum of money about. It would be considered, in the world of criminal activities, a very large sum of money, and it had been lying here as of no value in a draw of the library table since the day on which the gold certificates had arrived on my check from the Boston Bank. Madame Barris had not taken the currency away as I imagined. It was extremely careless of her, but was it not an act in character? What would such a woman know of practical concern? I spoke to the butler. He should not wait up. I would let myself in, and I went out. I remember that I'd got a cap and stick out of the rack, there was no element of selection in the cap, but there was a decided subconscious direction about the selection of the stick. It was a heavy blackthorn with an iron ferrule and a silver weight set in the head, picked up by my father at some Irish fair, a weapon, in fact. It was not dark. It was one of those clear, hard nights that are not uncommon on this island in midsummer. With a full moon, the road was visible even in the wood. I swung along it with no particular precaution. I was not expecting anything to happen, and in fact nothing did happen on the way into the village. But in this attitude of confidence I failed to discover an event of this night that might have given the whole adventure a different ending. There is a point near the village where a road enters our private one, skirts the border of the mountain, and making a great turn, enters the village from the south. At this division of the road, I heard distinctly a sound in the wood. It was not a sound to incite inquiry. It was the sound of some 
considerable animal moving in the leaves a few steps beyond the road. It did not impress me at the time. Estrays were constantly at large in our forest in summer, and not infrequently a roaming buck from the near preserves. There was also here, in addition to the other roads, an abandoned winter wood road that ran westward along the island to a small farming settlement. Doubtless I took a slighter notice of the sound, because estrays from the farmer's fields usually trespass on us from this road. At any rate, I went on. I fear that I was much engrossed with the memory of Madame Barris, not wholly with the feminine lore of her, although, as I have written, she was the perfection of that lore. One passed women at all milestones on the way to age, and kept before them one's sound estimates of life, but before this woman one lost one's head, as though nature evaded heretofore would not be denied. But the weird fortune that had attended her was in my mind. Married to Signor Barras out of the door of a convent, carried to Rio de Janeiro to an unbearable life, escaping with a remnant of her inheritance in English banknotes, she arrives here to visit the one old persisting friend, Mrs. Jordan, and finds her dead. And what seemed strange, incredibly beyond belief, was this creature Barras had thought only of her fortune, which she had depleted in two years to something less than twenty thousand pounds, which I had exchanged for her into our money, a mere fragment of her great inheritance. I listened to the story, entranced with the alluring teller of it, wondering, as I now wondered, on the road to the village, how anything pretending to be man could think of money when she was before his eye. What could he buy with money that equaled her? And yet this curious jackal had seen in her only the key to a strong box. There was behind it, in explanation, shadowed out, the glamour of an empire that Signor Barras would set up with the millions in his country of revolutions, and the enthusiasms of a foolish mother. And yet the jackal in this wreckage had not touched her. There was no stain, no crumpled leaf. She was a fresh wonder, even after this, out of a chrysalis. It was this amazing nudeness, this virginity of blossom, from which one could not escape. The word of my reflection brought me up. How had she escaped from Barras? I had more than once in my reflections pivoted on the word, the great hotel was nearly deserted when I entered. There was the glow of a cigar where someone smoked at the end of the long porch. Within there was only a sleepy clerk. Madame Barras had not arrived, he was quite sure. She had gone out to dinner somewhere and had not come in. I was profoundly concerned, but I took a moment to reflect before deciding what to do. I stepped outside, and there, coming up from the shadow of the porch, I met Sir Henry Marquis. It was chance at its extreme of favor. If I had been given the selection in all the world, I should have asked for Sir Henry Marquis at that decisive moment. The relief I felt made my words extravagant. Marquis, I cried, you here. Ah, Winthrop, he said in his drawling Oxford voice, what have you done with Madame Barris? I was waiting for her. I told him in a word how she had set out from my house, my concern, the walk down here and this result. I did not ask him at the moment how he happened to be here, or with a knowledge of our guest. I thought that Marquis was in Canada, but one does not with success inquire of a CID official, even in his own country. One met him in the most unexpected places, unconcerned, and one would have said at leisure. But he was concerned tonight. What I told him brought him up. He stood for a moment silent, then he said softly, in order that the clerk behind us might not overhear, Don't speak of it, I will get a light and go with you. He returned in a moment and we went out. He asked me about the road, was there only one way down, and I told him precisely, there was only the one road into the village and no way to miss it unless one turned into the public road at the point where it entered our private one along the mountain. He pitched at once upon this point, and we hurried back. We had hardly a further word on the way. I was decidedly uneasy about Madame Barras by now, and Marquis's concern was hardly less evident. 
he raced along in his immense stride and i had all i could manage to keep up it may seem strange that i should have brought such a man as sir henry marquis into the search with so little explanation of my guest or the affair but one must remember marquis was an old acquaintance frequently seen about in the world to thus on the spot so to speak draft into my service the first gentleman i found was precisely what any one would have done it was probably after all that there had been some reason why the cut under had taken the other road and madame barris was quite all right it was better to make sure before one raised the village and marquis markedly was beyond any aid of the village could have furnished this course was strikingly justified by every after event he said that the night was not dark the sky was hard with stars like a mosaic this white moonlight entered through the treetops and in a measure illumined the road we were easily able to see when we reached the point that the cut under had turned out into the road circling the mountain to the west of the village the track was so clearly visible in the light that i must have observed it had i been thinking of the road instead of the one who had set out upon it i was going on quickly when marquis stopped he was stooping over the track of this vehicle he did not come on and i went back what is it i said he answered still stooping above the track the cut under stopped here how do you know that i asked for it seemed hardly possible to determine where a wheeled vehicle had stopped it's quite clear he replied the horses moved about without going on i saw it now the hoof marks of the horse had displaced the dust where it had several times changed position and that's not all marquis continued something has happened to the cut under here i was now closely beside him it was broken down perhaps or some accident to the harness no he replied the wheel tracks are here broadened as though they had skidded on a turn this would mean little if the cut under had been moving at the time but it was not moving the horse was standing the cut under had stopped he went on as though in a reflection to himself the vehicle must have been violently thrown about here by something i had a sudden inspiration i see it i cried the horse took fright stopped and then bolted there has been a runaway that accounts for the turn out let's hurry but marquis detained me with a firm hand on my arm no he said the horse was not running when it turned out and it did not stop here in fright the horse was entirely quiet here the hoof marks would show any alarm in the animal and moreover if it had stopped in fright there would have been an inevitable recoil which would have thrown the wheels of the vehicle backward out of their track no moving animal man included stopped by fright fails to register this recall we always look for it in evidences of violent assaults fingerprints invariably show it and one learns thereby unerringly the direction of the attack he rose his hand still extended and upon my arm there is only one possible explanation he added something happened in the cut under to throw it violently about in the road and it happened with the horse undisturbed and the vehicle standing still the wheel tracks are widened only at one point showing a transverse but no lateral movement of the vehicle a struggle i cried major carrington was right madame barris has been attacked by the driver marquis's hand held me firmly in the excitement of that realization it was entirely composed there was even a drawl in his voice as he answered me major carrington whoever he may be he said is wrong if we exclude a third party it was madame barris who attacked the driver his fingers tightened under my obvious protest it is quite certain he continued taking the position of the standing horse it will be the front wheels of the cut under that have made this widened track the wheels under the driver's seat and not the wheels under the guest seat in the rear of the vehicle there has been a violent struggle in this cut under but it was a struggle that took place wholly in the front of the vehicle he went on in his maddeningly imperturbable calm no one attacked our guests but someone here at this precise point did attack the driver of this vehicle for god's sake i cried let's hurry 
He stepped back slowly to the edge of the road, and the drawl in his voice lengthened. We do hurry, he said. We hurry to the value of knowing that there was no accident here to the harness, no fright to the horse, no attack on the lady, and no change in the direction which the vehicle afterwards took. Suppose we had gone on in a different form of hurry, ignorant of these facts. At this point I distinctly heard again the sound of a heavy animal in the wood. Marquis also heard it, and he plunged into the thick bushes. Almost immediately we were at the spot, and before us some heavy object turned in the leaves. Marquis whipped an electric flash out of his pocket. The body of a man, tied at the hands and heels behind with a hitching strap, and with a linen carriage lap cloth wound around his head and knotted, lay there endeavoring to ease the rigor of his position by some movement. We should now know in a moment what desperate thing had happened. I cut the strap while Marquis got the lap cloth unwound from about the man's head. It was the driver of the cut under, but we got no gain from his discovery. As soon as his face was clear, he tore out of our grasp and began to run. He took the old road to the westward of the island, where perhaps he lived. We were wholly unable to stop him, and we got no reply to our shouted queries except his wild cry for help. He considered us his assailants, from whom by chance he had escaped. It was folly to think of coming up with a man. He was set desperately for the westward of the island, and would never stop until he reached it. We turned back into the road. Marcus's method now changed. He turned swiftly into the road along the mountain which the cut under had taken after its capture. I was at the extreme of a deadly anxiety about Madame Barris. It seemed to me now certain that some gang of criminals having knowledge of the packet of money had waylaid the cut under. Proud of my conclusion, I put the inquiry to Sir Henry as we hurried along, if we weren't too late. He stopped suddenly, like a man brought up at the point of a bayonet. My word, he jerked the expression out through his tightened jaws. Has she got ninety thousand dollars of your money? And he set out again in his long stride. I explained briefly as I endeavored to keep his pace. It was her own money, not mine, but she did in fact have that large sum with her in the cut under on this night. I gave him the story of the matter, briefly, for I had no breath to spare over it, and I asked him what he thought. Had a gang of thieves attacked the cut under? But he only repeated his expression. My word, you got her ninety thousand dollars and let her drive away with no eye on her? Such trust in the honesty of our fellow creatures. My word. I had to admit the deplorable negligence, but I had not thought of any peril, and I did not know that she carried the money with her until the conversation with my sister. There was some excuse for me. I could not remember a robbery on this island. Marquis snapped his jaws. You'll remember this one, he said. It was a ridiculous mark. How could one ever forget if this incomparable creature were robbed and perhaps murdered? But were there not some extenuating circumstances in my favor? I presented them as we advanced. My sister and I lived in a rather protected atmosphere, apart from all criminal activities. We could not foresee such a result. I had no knowledge of criminal methods. I can well believe it, was the only reply Marquis returned to me. In addition to my extreme anxiety about Madame Barras, I began now to realize a profound sense of responsibility. Everyone, it seems, saw what I ought to have done, except myself. How had I managed to overlook it? It was clear to other men. Major Carrington had pointed it out to me as I was turning away, and now here Sir Henry Marquis was expressing in no uncertain terms how negligent a creature he considered me. To permit my guest, a woman, to go alone at night with this large sum of money. It was not a pleasant retrospect. Other men, the world, would scarcely hold me to a lesser negligence than Sir Henry Marquis. I could not forbear, even in our haste to seek some consolation. Do you think Madame Barris has been hurt? Hurt, he repeated. How should Madame Barris be hurt? In the robbery, I said. Robbery, and he repeated that word. There's been no robbery. 
I replied in some astonishment. Really, Sir Henry, you but now assured me that I would remember this night's robbery. The drawl got back into his voice. Ah, yes, he said, quite so. You will remember it. The man was clearly, it seemed to me, so engrossed with the mystery that it was idle to interrogate him, and he was walking with a devil's stride. Still the pointed query of the affair pressed me, and I made another effort. Why did these assailants take Madame Barras on with it? Marquis regarded me, I thought, with wonder. The devil, man, he said, they couldn't leave her behind. The danger would be too great to them? No, he said, the danger would be too great to her. At this moment an object before us in the road diverted our attention. It was the cut under and the horse. They were standing by the roadside where it makes a great turn to enter the village from the south. There is a wide border to the road at this point, clear of underbrush, where the forest edges it, and there are, in the whim of some one, or by chance, two great flat stones, one lying upon the other, but not fitting by a hand's thickness by reason of the uneven surfaces. What had now happened was evident. The assailants of the cut under had abandoned it here before entering the village. They could not, of course, go on with this incriminating vehicle. The sight of the cut under here had on Marquis the usual effect of an important evidential sign. He at once ceased to hurry. He pulled up, looked over the cut under and the horse, and began to saunter about. This careless manner was difficult for me at such a time, but for his assurance that Madame Barris was uninjured it would have been impossible. I had a blind confidence in the man, although his Expressions were so absurdly in conflict. I started to go on toward the village, but as he did not follow, I turned back. Marquis was sitting on the flat stones with a cigarette in his fingers. Good heavens, man, I cried, you're not stopping to smoke a cigarette. Not this cigarette, at any rate, he replied. Madame Barris has already smoked it. I can, perhaps, find you the burnt match. He got the electric flash out of his pocket and stooped over immediately he made an exclamation of surprise. I leaned down beside him. There was a little heap of charred paper on the brown bed of pine needles. Marquis was about to take up this charred paper when his eye caught something thrust in between the two stones. It was a handful of torn bits of paper. Marquis got them out and laid them on the top of the flat stones under his light. Ah, he said, Madame Barras, while she smoked, got rid of some money. The package of gold certificates? I cried. She has burned them? No, he replied. Madame Barris has favored your treasury in her destructive process. These are five-pound notes of the Bank of England. I was astonished, and I expressed it. But why should Madame Barris destroy notes of the Bank of England? I imagine, he answered, that they were some which she had, by chance, failed to give you for exchange. But why would she destroy them, I went on. I conclude, he drawled, that she was not wholly certain that she would escape. Escape, I cried. You have been assuring me all along that Madame Barris is making no effort to escape. Oh, no, he replied. She is making every effort. I was annoyed and puzzled. What is it, I said, precisely that Madame Barris did here? Can you tell me in plain words? Surely, he replied, she sat here while something was decided, and while she sat here she smoked the cigarette, and while she smoked the cigarette she destroyed the money. But, he added, before she had quite finished, a decision was made, and she hastily thrust the remaining bits of the torn notes into the crevice between these stones. What decision, I said. Marquis gathered up the bits of torn paper and put them into his pocket with a switched-off flash. I wish I knew that, he said. Knew what? Which path they had taken, he replied. There seemed to be two branching from this point, but they pass over a bed of pine needles, and that retains no impression. Where do these paths lead? I did not know that any paths came into the road at this point, but the island is veined over with old paths. The lead of paths here, however, was fairly evident. They must come out somewhere on the sea i said right he cried take either and let's be off madame's cigarette was not quite cold when i picked it up 
I was right about the direction of the paths, but as it happened, the one Marquis took was nearly double the distance of the other to the sea, and I have wondered always if it was chance that selected the one taken by the assailants of the cut under, as it was chance that selected the one taken by us. Marquis was instantly gone, and I hurried along the path, running nearly due east. There was light enough entering from the brilliant moon through the treetops to make out the abandoned trail. And as I hurried, Marquis's contradicting expressions seemed to adjust themselves into a sort of order, and all at once I understood what had happened. The Brazilian adventurer had not taken the loss of his wife and the fortune in English pound sterling lying down. He had followed to recover them. I now saw clearly the reason for everything that had happened, the attack on the driver and my guest's concern to get rid of the English money which she discovered remaining in her possession. This man would have no knowledge of her gold certificates, but he would be searching for his English pounds and if she came clear of any trace of these five-pound notes, she might disclaim all knowledge of them, and perhaps send him elsewhere on his search, since it was always the money and not the woman that he sought. This explanation was hardly realized before it was confirmed. I came out abruptly onto a slope of bracken, and before me at a few paces on the path were Madame Boris and two men, one at some distance in advance of her, disappearing at the moment behind a spur of the slope that hid us from the sea, and I got no conception of him. But the creature at her heels was a huge foreign beast of a man, in the dress of a common sailor. What happened was over in a moment. I was nearly on the man when I turned out of the wood, and with a shout to Madame Boris I struck at him with a heavy walking stick. But the creature was not to be taken unaware. He darted to one side, wrenched the stick out of my hand, and dashed its heavy-weighted head into my face. I went down in the bracken, but I carried with me into unconsciousness a vision of Madame Boris that no shadow of the lengthening years can blur. She had swung round sharply at the attack behind her, and she stood bare-haired and bare-shouldered, knee-deep in the golden bracket, with the glory of the moon on her, her arms hanging, her lips parted, her great eyes wide with terror as lovely in her desperate extremity as a dream, as a painted picture. I don't know how long I was down there, but when I finally got up, and following along the path behind the spur of rock, came out onto the open sea, I found Sir Henry Marquis. He was standing with his hands in the pockets of his loose tweed coat, and he was cursing softly. The ferry and the mainland are patrolled. I didn't think of their having an ocean-going yacht. A gleam of light was disappearing into the open sea. He put his hands into his pocket and took out the scraps of torn paper. These notes, he said, like the ones which you hold in your bank vault, were never issued by the Bank of England. I stammered some incoherent sentence, and the great chief of the Criminal Investigation Department of Scotland Yard turned towards me. Do you know who that woman is? Surely, I cried, she went to school with my sister at Miss Pages. She came to visit Mrs. Jordan. He looked at me steadily. She got the data about your sister out of the Back Bay biographies and used the accident of Mrs. Jordan's death to get in with it. The rest was all fiction. Madame Boris, I stuttered. You mean Madame Boris? Madame the Devil, he said. That sunny Suzanne used to be in the Hungarian Follies until the Soviet government of Austria picked her up to place the imitation English money that its presses were striking off in. End of The Lost Lady